back. We're live at three o'clock. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is Global Connections with uh, Alexander Moral, who's a law professor uh, in, wait, St. Paul. Did I get that right? No, American University, actually, over in D.C. Okay. And we've been um, talking about uh, war crimes and atrocities for uh, the better part of uh, a month. And um, everybody has a comment on it, um, but it's uh, so far a lot of talk. And um, we're here, Alexander and me, um, to figure out what, what actually is going on in terms of prosecuting war crimes against, uh, Ale uh, against uh, Putin and Russia and, um, and what is happening in the courts and what could happen in the courts. So I'm really happy to be with you. This is a show I've waited for, and it's about time we got down to the bedrock of what is happening, if anything, and what is going to happen, and what could happen uh, in that context. Welcome to the show, Alexander. Well, thanks. I'm, I'm glad to be there. It's, it is a topic of great importance and urgency, I have to say. You know, in, um, in uh, Nuremberg, there were 22 defendants, 19 of them were convicted, and 12 of them were put to death. Um, but actually, they killed six million people, uh, which is, you know, a, a very interesting ratio uh, that although you could say, you know, there was a, an international benefit in doing that, the fact is the numbers do not speak highly of the system uh, because we know that there were many, many more people. Um, and in this case, um, likewise, the system isn't doing very well. The system in the United Nations, the system in the Internet. International Court of Justice, Court of Criminal Justice, um, and for that matter, you know, the other courts. And I am reminded, of, and I will say one more thing before I open it up to you, uh, that a month ago, a, a Syrian general was tried uh, in Germany uh, under something called universal jurisdiction. They caught him, they tried him, they convicted him. And I don't know what happened after that, but that was that was pretty interesting and that maybe that sure. is a, a point to discuss here. Um, but it also shows that you really, aside from the evidence, you do have to have evidence to have a, a, a trial on war crimes. You, you also have to have the body of, I mean, the person, the defendant in within your, physically within your jurisdiction. And this may be problematic. In any event, a lot of talk. Someone said yesterday that there are 5,000 you know, investigators, 5,000 investigators in Ukraine right now investigating and documenting war crimes. They don't have to do that for me. I've seen it on television every day. I'm satisfied beyond, a, beyond any reasonable doubt. Um, so your thoughts about where we are on the continuum toward actually prosecuting these people, mostly Putin, um, and actually punishing them and of course, the big question, which we should discuss at some point in this program is, is any of that uh, such a threat to Putin and his generals um, so as to slow them down in what they are doing every day, every minute in Ukraine in terms of further atrocities? So the first question is, what is going on right now? Do we know? Well, yes and no. I think we know some. We, we also don't know quite a bit. There's probably a lot going on that will come up as very significant, including investigations, including all kinds of, of legal proceedings that are not public at this point in time. Uh, you were mentioning the International Criminal Court. That is one of the international tribunals that actually is working. Uh, has been working very quickly after the invasion started. The prosecutor himself started the investigation and he kind of sent a little message, sort of uh, a signaling to the general public saying, it would be nice if somebody would refer that to me so I actually have a legal basis for it. So it, by now, I think 43 nations referred the Ukraine situation to the court and, and the pretrial chamber is dealing with it too. That's uh, a slow moving process. I mean, if you look at the Yugoslavia tribunal, that's the most most active in the, in the historical past. Uh, 
Some of those people were tried 20 years after the fact. So we, we can't expect those two, those judges to step in and stop the war in many ways, right? So we, we're looking at a multitude of things that are happening, happening in the international uh, court of justice. Uh, there we actually have the strongest legal document that we could get from that court. They issued preliminary measures that basically ordered uh, Russia to stop its war to make sure that any of its agents stop being involved in any action that violates international law. And that is actually legally binding. You know? So from the, from the legal point of view, if we look at this strictly through the lens of lawyers, uh, everything that can happen is happening relatively quickly. Uh, the Council of Europe uh, removed uh, Russia from its uh, membership list after the uh, reports of atrocities happening. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights, on the other hand, is still looking into all these matters, and it recently said it will be looking into matters all the way up to September of this year. So whatever Russia will be doing in Ukraine or in Russia can be looked at from that international court's legal perspective. Uh, again, will that stop the war? Also, probably not. Uh, we, we, have to, we have to ultimately say, you know, judges in robes are not the same as, as, as fighters in, in tanks. They have a different role to play, but they contribute to resolving that problem. Uh, and, and uh, you know, before you ask me this, I know you will say that isn't that absolutely not, not satisfactory. Absolutely, it is not satisfactory, right? Uh, we, have, we have flaws in the system, probably more flaws than success stories in many ways. And, and you know, if you start talking about non-tribunals like the Security Council, that is an integrated structural flaw that's been sitting there since the 1940s and nobody fixed it. How can Russia sit in the, in the, the governing body that has to step in and stop what they're doing and veto it and basically make Make, make sure that nothing happens in that forum at all. Mm. You know, I think it, this is at, at, the, at the base of it, it's a flaw in human nature um, that we have wars and we have invasions like this. We have murder, mass murder. We have atrocities. It's been going on a long time. And, and I think um, if we look for a way that that has stopped it, it's usually by a war where the offending party loses, or maybe the other side too. <laughs> that's the way that's the way these issues are resolved by violence. And it's almost as if humanity needs a big brother, a parent, in loco parentis, you know, somebody mm -hmm. who will say, Now you you're you're acting badly here, you're misbehaving, and you must stop, or I'm gonna smack you in the, in the side of the head. Uh, yeah. but we don't have that, not even close. I mean, after the war was over, the U.S. and through and, you know, and the U.N. through the U.S. had a fair amount of power to do exactly that. Um, you know, smack them on the side of the head if they violated the norms. Um, but that has disappeared over time. And certainly during the Trump administration, it, uh, the disappearance accelerated. Um, Europe is not together enough to do a whole lot. And uh, the U.S. certainly is not together enough to do with political problems. And so what you have is no big brother, no parent, no in loco parentis, nobody to say, stop. So you get a psychopath, that's my term, uh, like, like Putin. And, um, you know, he feels he can do this because he can, uh, whether it's for power, whether it's to aggrandize this, uh, you know, go back to the Soviet Union, whether, whatever it is, whatever psychological or historical reason doesn't much matter. He's doing atrocities. And it demonstrates that, um, you know, it actually it calls attention to the fact that atrocities have been happening in South America, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, and in Europe for a long time. And the structures that we have built in and around the United Nations have really not stopped those atrocities. They continue to happen. And I think, you know, we are at a kind of inflection point. We really have to stop him. On the other hand, when he gets up and says, uh, hey, don't fool with me, I'm going to do nuclear weapons on you, um, people are understandably reluctant um, mm -hmm. to, to do anything. And this is the problem when you're dealing with a psychopath, because he's one, he's one step ahead of you and he has no feelings. Um, and I, I don't know what we can do, either in the larger sense, to stop him, or in the prosecutorial sense. 
I agree with you that these war crime trials take a long time. And uh, yes, there has to be evidence. Evidence takes a long time. And there are jurisdictional issues, right? All of international law is loaded with jurisdictional obstacles. And the same here. I mean, for example, you know, you say that the Security Council is flawed because Russia sits on the Security Council as a matter of the, you know, original UN Charter. But uh, what about the uh, courts? What about the, um, you know, international courts? Can Russia foul them up too? Can China foul them up? Um, are they already impotent? Um, you know, this is not Nuremberg. This is not where you have a big brother. Um, this is a situation where uh, any number of political considerations can intervene and uh, pull the rug out from under these courts. So it's not clear that the evidence will be there. I mean, proven. You and I know about the evidence. We watch it on television. But proven to the satisfaction of the court. We don't, don't know about the political nature of the court or the judges, for that matter. Um, we, we don't know about, um, you know, I, I told one of our co-hosts who feels very strongly about this, that she should simply go to Moscow and make a citizen's arrest. <laughs> no, who is going to take him out of Russia? Right. You know, there's no way he's going he's gonna to get to Brussels uh, or The Hague. No way. And so I, I feel that, um, you know, uh, this may or may not be on a track that goes somewhere. So in a perfect world, though, Alexander, if it all works out swell, what, what would happen? What are the steps? Um, and what are the possible punishments? Well, let, let's look at it through different lenses. One is punishment. One is criminal law. How do, who do we go after? How do we go after them? And what's the purpose and outcome? You know, you're talking about the leadership of Russia. You're also talking about those who actually uh, work with Putin in many, many ways. The, the leadership of the military, civilian administration, the oligarchs, whoever is backing all of this, who is responsible for this, to what extent. That's something that the International Criminal Court can and look, in principle can look at. Uh, it's more of a practical question, will they ever be in a, in a position to actually look at that? Because you need to have defendants in court to actually try them. This court does not try people in absentia, and I think that's a good thing uh, in many ways, because it, it gives defense rights. Even people who are, as you call them, psychopaths, have a right to defend themselves in court here. Uh, now, our Rome court, our Rome statute court is different already from the Nuremberg one because it's not victor justice, it's not the states that actually won World War II, put a tribunal in place. However, while that worked, actually, it came up with very good, solid judgments, but that was a, a personal matter, I think, of the quality of the people who were actually on the prosecutorial side, but also on the judges' side here. Uh, the Rome Statute Court is, is one that is set up to prevent, in a way, by deterring. It didn't work in this context here, but it looks, at, it looks more neutrally at things. It's, it's not, uh, you know, judges from the winning side that ultimately sit in judgment over those who lose. There is Russian judges on that court as well. There is Russian judges in the International Court of Justice here. Uh, let, me, let me give you a little bit more kind of legalese on that, because I think we, we need to uplift international law uh, in the face of, of, these, of the weapons talking right now. Can we, can we turn this around and get back to actually repairing the situation in a way, coming up with compensation, with responsibility, accountability, and then build something better? Uh, it's not impossible. If you look at the provisional measures that the International Court of Justice ordered, it was one of the three was unanimous, actually, with the Russian and Chinese judges agreeing uh, that both parties have to stop aggravating the situation. There was an order issued to both parties. The Ukrainians were not happy about that. They were saying, well, we are not doing any things. But anyway, it was unanimous. Uh, the remainder was was uh, two judges dissenting, actually didn't file dissenting opinions, but declarations to the judgment. The Russian judge merely said the court has no competence. It, it didn't say the Russians are right. They just said this is a case where we don't have jurisdiction. Uh, and the reason is because Ukraine used, uses the genocide convention, basically. What they're saying is Russia is using the genocide convention as a pretext for justifying their military operations 
by saying that Ukraine was violating the rights of people in Donbass, in Donbass region. And therefore, Russia had to intervene because Ukraine was committing genocide. Now, Ukraine is arguing in the court that's an abuse because they were not. And therefore, the court has jurisdiction. Now, that jurisdiction is, is a little wobbly, in my personal opinion. Uh, and, and, and one of the judges said that, actually. One of the judges said, I'm not sure whether we have jurisdiction, but this is so bad. We need to order provisional measures, which is a, a strange way of tackling legal questions, too. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm contemplating very seriously the question of the International Criminal Court. I, I do believe uh, investigations indeed are starting. I have no doubt about that. And look at Karadzic, look at Milosevic. Nobody thought that, you know, the head of the military in Serbia or the president of the former Yugoslav Republic of Serbia would, would end up in trial. And they did. Right? There are so many factors that can contribute to this. Since we don't know where this is going, it's all a little speculative, a little bit of a speculation, I think. But we can also speculate in a way uh, where that might go. And then ultimately, a crucial thing is what do we do with the victims? I think that that's a question not just of, of accountability and, and compensation and making them whole again. It's also a question of preventing future victimization through the same thing. And, and yes, you can look at other major powers that are contemplating similar actions. They're out there and they're observing uh, the entire package of, of sanctions and responses and, and military support and so on very carefully uh, and wondering what might happen if they took that step. You know, Nuremberg was after the war was over and Milosevic uh, didn't get tried until after the war was over. Right. Here, the war is still going on. I shouldn't yeah. say war. It's a bad word. It's the invasion and the violation of every human right you can think of is going on every day in front of us, in front of you and me, in front of Western Europe, in front of the U.S., uh, the U.S. Congress, which is uh, troubled with many, many other things. Um, and so, uh, you know, there seems to be something upside down where we were talking about war crimes that are happening real time, war crimes that, that are happening today, tomorrow, the day after. Uh, it's almost, you know, it, what strikes me is that this is not adequate. The whole concept of it is not adequate. You know, uh, and, and, and Mr. Putin has made this clear. Uh, he has shown us that our system of looking at war crimes is, 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 is archaic. Um, I just wonder, you know, A, is there a chance that the UN Charter will be reformed? I would say zero to none. Uh, <laughs> is there a chance that uh, the war crimes, uh, you know, infrastructure, legal infrastructure will be reformed and improved and made more real time? Uh, zero to none. Um, we have a big problem in our hands. And, and the end, at the end of the day, it, it goes to that point that I made earlier. And that is the way you solve these problems is with violence. And if you win, then you get to call the shots. And then you say, no more of this. <clears throat> and that lasts for maybe one, two generations. And then you're back doing it again. You know, we have a flawed species is what we have. And I don't know the solution now. I mean, we learn the hard way and then we don't. Um, there's a question here though. Let me see if I can, uh, wait. Republic of China. Uh, is uh, one of the five permanent members. The Soviet Union is not Russia. I don't know if this makes sense. Russia sits in the Soviet seat because it claimed to be the sole legal successor state to the Soviet Union, taking over all the old country's obligations, debts, and privileges. It notified the UN Secretary General <clears throat> Uh, in a letter on December 24th, 1991, the UN appears to have done nothing to investigate, corroborate, or think through the implications. It simply acquiesced. Now, there's an interesting point. Yep. Uh, it's not the same country. What do you think? It's it's a very interesting point, actually. The uh, the Ukrainian ambassador to the United Nations brought that up very early on when he was talking in the General Assembly. 
uh, that there's no there's no clarity as to why Russia is occupying the seat that formerly was the Soviet Union seat. That's a question of state succession, basically. And, and, and in that area, there's a little bit of international law. But in that area, a lot of sovereignty comes back in. So when, when there is a, a large junk and Russia is the larger junk of the Soviet Union, basically it says we are the successors and the others have to uh, re reapply for membership, basically. Uh, then that is de facto and ultimately also legally speaking what it is. So I think there is no legal way of, of questioning the, the legitimacy of Russia's presence as a permanent member in the UN Security Council. Uh, and that's state practice as well as, uh, again, the principle of sovereignty, essentially. If, if you look at other, other divorces, and the, the, one of the divorces was, for instance, Czechoslovakia, right, which split into the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Here, too, the Czech Republic was agreed would be the successor and Slovakia would have to basically come and apply for membership again. Uh, it's not fair. It doesn't make a lot of sense in that way. You could probably say all of those should be successors, but that's what the status quo of the law is. So that, that's really uh, not, not a solid legal argument, but it was a provocative argument produced by the ambassador and the Ukrainian ambassador at that point. I think what makes it interesting is uh, if you put that question to interpret that in mm -hmm. front of the General Assembly, <clears throat> I don't know what the vote would have to be, but if you put it in front of the General Assembly, you're going to get this pretty much the same breakdown uh, as there was when they tried to get a condemnation, when they got a condemnation resolution through. And I would say uh, it was, um, you know, 150 countries out of 200, thereabouts. Um, and, the, and the reason is that a lot of countries were, were on the same side as Russia uh, or, or abstained. Uh, and, and this and this means that it's all the much more difficult to take action within the United States. I'm sorry, within the United Nations um, against Russia, because Russia has friends there. Russia has uh, uh, allies um, and has political partners and economic partners and oil partners and so forth, uh, which who are not going to leave it. And India is a good example. Um, from a moral point of view, you know, there's no way they can defend what Russia is doing. But from an economic and geopolitical point of view, they do. Um, and so there are a lot of countries, uh, and, and far worse than that, uh, in Africa and Latin America, who are never going to vote against Russia. So even if there was a, a stark provision in the United, United Nations Charter saying this could be interpreted against Russia or changed, vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, who's on the Security Council, it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily get a, a unanimous vote. No, not unanimous. I mean, there's a difference between abstaining and saying no, and the ones that actually said no were just five, including Russia, and, and, and not necessarily the strongest one. I mean, Eritrea, who's ever heard about that? Uh, and North Korea, who wants to be friend with those people? But there were major powers, including China and India, that abstained in the General Assembly. That, that's for sure. Now, let, let's talk about this an, an interesting issue. Why, why can we have Russia vetoing all the, all these things in the Security Council? And, and the, there is, I mean, you see a local chess club, right? If if a, a chess player stands accused of violating the rules of chess, would that chess player then be allowed to sit in the chess clubs? Uh, tribunal adjudicating his or her fault? Probably not, right? One would have to recuse himself or herself. Same thing, we have issues in the US Supreme Court right now, right? Uh, who would have to not sit on certain cases? If they I, 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 wish, I wish you didn't, you didn't bring that up. <laughs> But I mean, it, uh, it comes back with a vengeance when you talk about Russia. How can Russia not, not only sit on the Security Council and be one of the voices, but have the voice to actually throw everything overboard by saying, no, we veto this? Uh, my, my personal opinion is it, it should not. The charter says so, but international treaties develop through practice. Right. So what, what I would recommend, and if anybody listens who actually does that, they should probably think about it. If the United Nations General Assembly were to ask the International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion, whether Russia should take part in Security Council voting at this point in time, or let alone exercise its veto power, that would, would probably, by, 50, by 13 votes to two, with maybe two abstentions say, no, it cannot, because the charter has to be interpreted 
given you know new developments essentially uh, in a living fashion as as um, applied in 2022 and, and not 1949 um and and once you have that once you have that advisory opinion the security council could actually move ahead and kick russia out yeah. will that go fast it takes a while yeah uh, the, the, the has anybody of, suggested this publicly um no i'm probably the first one because it's kind of aggressive strategy but it's not impossible uh, will it will it will it prevent the conflict from going on? Absolutely not, because it will take a long time. And will Russia, even if it's kicked out of the Security Council, all of a sudden follow the Security Council resolutions? Probably not. But we are building, for sure, we are building a, an entire set of of legal precedents, legal standards, and legal pronouncements that ultimately, when this enters the mopping up stage will will kick in with a vengeance so we, we should look forward in this respect too well i hope so you know what what troubles me is that um one of the things that putin has up his sleeve is this phony baloney settlement you know a truce uh, a, a, some kind of negotiated result even if it he consider he considers it a win for him you know and a, and a surrender for uh, ukraine um but if there is an agreement okay mm -hmm. I just know what is going to happen. Um, Putin is going to insist on the rollback of all the sanctions, and he's going to uh, uh, insist on exoneration for war crimes. Now, I don't know if he'll get that, but that would certainly be on the table. You know, let's the old thing about like Trump. Let's leave all this behind, uh, gentlemen. Let's move forward. We don't need to dwell in the past. And uh, what you need to do is forgive us for all the war crimes uh, and uh, let go of all the sanctions. Now, I, I would myself never, ever agree to any of that. But in the, in the context of uh, a, a Western Europe uh, that would really like to get the oil flowing again and like to get back to some degree of normalcy, uh, they might be amenable to, to things like that, don't you think? Yeah, possibly. I think that that's probably also one of the reasons why I think strategic thinking would say, let's not negotiate with Putin at personam, but let's see whether we find the way of negotiating with Russia as a legal entity. I guess then you have some more durability to, to an agreement if it's if it's ever reached. If it's just a Putin agreement, I mean, he had with Donbass, with, with Crimea, he had agreements. There, there are agreements in place. Uh, that now with the invasion he is clearly breaching. Uh, if I was advising Zelensky, I would say go ahead and sign whatever because it's not going to be legally valid. Ever heard about the concept of coercion? Right? If you sign a document under coercion and being invaded, probably sounds like coercion to me. <laughs> having your your civilians killed, having your armed forces under attack. So again, long run, right? Even if he agrees to sign away parts of his country, if he says Crimea shall be Russian from now on, go back to the International Court of Justice and say, can you please set this part of the agreement aside? Uh, the armistice part and the termination of hostilities part, that we stick with. We agree to that. But the part with signing our country away was under coercion. It's null and void. And the court will probably side with that. So mm. Russia will also, Russia will Russia abide by that decision? Uh, probably not, but not, not Putin and Putin's Russia not, but a future Russia. <laughs> might, there, there might be people even within Russia who think a little bit beyond September. So I'm assuming there are some people who are not in their 70s, they're probably a little bit younger, and they want to be part of a government in the future where they actually still have a job and, and they can probably leave Russia and travel somewhere. So I'm sure there's there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of educated people who are actually part of the Russian government who think very carefully about where this will be going. And, and we don't know where it's going, of course, and there's no prediction that can be made. But legally speaking, uh, there's a lot, lots of risks. Right. Ultimately, when this is actually worked up in the courts, however important they look right now, and they do, at some point, these people can come back with a vengeance. I, I, have, I have very strong respect, it's a professional obligation of mine, for people in robes. Uh, also, because when they put the robes on, many of them actually shed their uh, nationalistic preoccupations <laughs> with things. Uh, we have stories about... You can say that about the United States Supreme Court, but that's another show. 
Yeah, that's a different show. Yeah, and it's it's a very specific international tribunal thing, actually. Uh, and 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 there's good press, good examples for that actually. When when the former Eastern Europe, the former communist countries joined international courts, especially the European Court of Human Rights, their judges were ferocious human rights activists. So these people pushed the agenda in the in a very liberal direction, actually, coming from recently uh, transitioned countries. I have a question from uh, another viewer. Uh, we're going to go a little over. I hope that's okay with you, Alexander. No, well, that's fine. <clears throat> isn't what Russia is? This is from uh, Chang Wang. You know him. Uh, mm -hmm. Isn't isn't what Russia is doing in Ukraine right now, bombing hospitals and killing civilians to in instill fear? We don't know their purpose, but he says to instill fear, just outright terrorism. Um, I'm not sure that's on the point of uh, war crimes, but uh, do you have a que an answer to that question? Uh, there, there's strong indications that um, bombings of civilian infrastructure, including hospitals, which are predicted entities, of course, uh, schools, theaters, we have seen those uh, do take place. Now, it could be because of the uh, lack of ability of the Russian armed forces. It could all be by coincidence, but the more, the more incidents you have, the less likely that becomes. So you would probably have a good uh, basis for saying this. There must be a plan behind that. It's not just a coincidence. Uh, but but you know, war crimes. We we also have crimes against humanity. Those acts would fall in the in the bracket of, of crimes against humanity. And we also in the Rome Statute have the crime of aggression. Right. That was inserted in 2010, actually. So the mere fact that Putin attacks with his military. Uh, Ukrainian territory is in itself an international crime that could bring not just him, but anybody who participates in an international tribunal. So there, there is a lot of uh, possible. Well, on that point, is what is what is happening deniable on his part? You know, I didn't know they were butchering people in Bucha. Uh, I didn't know they were blowing up hospitals and and uh, residential infrastructure. I didn't know they were destroying cities and shooting people in the street. I didn't know. Um, it's, it's my wayward uh, generals and troops. They were just very frustrated with losing and frustrated with being counterattacked. And they just took it in their own hands. Uh, it wasn't me. Is, does he get any traction for that? You know, isn't there a, a notion of like vicarious liability? If he knew this was happening, as we all do and did, uh, for weeks now, by virtue of global television, um, doesn't he know well enough to take action to stop it? Uh, is there a notion of vicarious liability when it comes to war crimes? Uh, yes, you actually, uh, as a head of state specifically, you have obligations not to just not commit war crimes, but also to stop, curtail, and, and, and terminate war crimes as they're happening. And if you don't do that, it, that can cause criminal responsibility, absolutely. Plus, the defense sounds very far-fetched. I mean, uh, even, even if even if he would claim that he watched only news from his own Russian TV channels, which uh, glorified this as an attack that is actually a defensive action and a special military operation, uh, you can't claim ignorance on, on that level. Plus, it would be go counter to what we basically know about, what heads of states know about the operation. Uh, so, so beyond mere responsibility for, for command responsibility, basically, it is also a, a very unlikely to succeed argument. I mean, these judges are not clowns. They would look right through this and say this is not a real argument. Uh, <laughs> of course, I mean, presidents don't have necessarily have responsibility for every war crime that happens. If, if you have a, a large military operation and a unit somewhere down the line with a captain as the commander, commits atrocious war crimes, you wouldn't drag the president into court uh, unless there was some kind of, uh, of connection that you can make actually as a prosecutor saying he ordered or he can condoned or supported this. Uh, but on this scale where you have lots of things happening, I think that's almost impossible. Plus again, the, the crime of aggression is always there and I, I cannot assume that any logical thinking judge on an international court would say this this was done by the oligarchs and the generals and Putin was always against it. Let's talk about um, non-United um, Nations and international court uh, situations. Um, I, I, we've had shows about, uh, about 
civil uh, war crimes by banks. For example, there's a case pending in Paris now against BNP, Banco Nacional de Paris, sure. um, for war crimes in Sudan. And the war crimes were, are, uh, that they, they supported by way of their financing uh, leaders who were engaging in war crimes, therefore, you know, uh, supporting those war crimes. And, and the uh, victims, uh, through the French prosecutorial system, are going after BNP in a French court. It has nothing to do with the United Nations or the International Court of Justice or, um, you know, any of the international structures, just French. And so uh, the Syrian general in Germany, just Germany. And so any country, in fact, let me add one more thing before I turn this over to you. And that is, suppose I am uh, uh, Zelensky and I catch a, a, I don't kill him, I catch him, I catch him, I catch a Russian general and I charge him with war crimes in Ukraine, my country. And I bring him before a Ukrainian court duly established under the laws of a sovereign nation that is Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And I find him guilty and I punish him accordingly. Can that happen? Can France or Germany or any country in Europe do the same? Absolutely, that, that's the idea actually. Accountability in foreign tribunals was the original idea before international law actually kicked in. There's jurisprudence from the 1920s about that. Um, yes, basically. Uh, there's the criminal prong here and the civil prong. We shouldn't forget the civil one. Can we, actually, can we sue people for damages for, for causing certain things? I mean, imagine you're a Ukrainian homeowner somewhere in the north of Kiev and your house has been bombed upon the orders of a Russian general. And you file a lawsuit you, like Paris currently, let's say uh, Southern District of New York, right? Can the Southern District of New York entertain that civil lawsuit? Uh, the answer is yes, maybe. Uh, because we have a statute, it's called the Alien Tort Statute, which is an old one from 1789, which basically gives the United States juris jurisdiction to try civil cases for torts committed in violation of international law. Uh, so basically, a U.S. court can entertain a civil action by a foreigner against another foreigner for a violation of international law abroad. Uh, we had that in the 70s. Antarctica was a famous torture case where a federal appeals court actually agreed that jurisdiction was there. Now we have the Bell case versus uh, Royal Dutch Petroleum 2013, where the Supreme Court restricted that very massively. Right, so now there is a U.S. Uh, security interest element in there, basically. So the court defers to the State Department saying whether this case should go forward, by and large, whether there is a security interest of the U.S. government in trying these civil cases. So well, let's, let's assume that you can, mm -hmm. in, if not in one country, then in the other. Yeah. And, um, you know, of course, uh, put me on the jury. I'm volunteering right now, Alexander. <laughs> I want to be there. I have a few things to say, um, but let's assume it's it's a it's a civil case. It's compensation. Mm -hmm. The one in Paris, for example, it's compensation. And, and how else do you make an impression on BNP? Um, it's compensation. So <clears throat> this is a very interesting set of circumstances because um, Ukraine, in many cities, we don't even know how many cities yet, has been leveled. Um, all the infrastructure has been destroyed. Every building. You know, for miles around, every home, uh, every, you know, public infrastructure destroyed. Um, what is that worth? What is it going to take to rebuild that? And you have virtually thousands of people um, who have been killed and who have wrongful death claims. Mm -hmm. Aggression that was not in any way justified. And you can say war, but it wasn't war. It was murder. Um, and then, And then, of course, you have all the people who were disrupted, their lives were completely disrupted, and they were in, in mortal fear uh, for themselves, their children, and their, and their husbands left back at home. I mean, this is all proven, already proven. Okay, so what is one life worth? What is one destruction, disruption of one life worth? And right now, what is it? How many millions of people 
are refugees uh, trying to find a place in Western Europe, which may or may not work out well for them. Um, you know, what, what is that worth one day in one life for one family with millions of families? And this would be against the nation of Russia. Um, it, it would also be against individuals if you could identify them and, and so forth, but mostly against the nation of Russia. It, it, the, the, the possibilities are just enormous, mind boggling in terms of how much collectively um, the result would be. It would be trillions of dollars. Um, could this happen? And what would, what would happen in the world uh, if these people had legitimate collectible judgments from various jurisdictions against the nation of Russia? Yeah, I mean, it, it could happen. It's, uh, it's the question of how many people would pursue such a course of action. It's costly as well. Could there be a strategy? Could, could non-governmental entities, maybe even governments supporting that, come up with a litigation strategy? That's quite possible. I think that that's definitely possible. Could it be trillions? Ultimately, it depends on so many national systems. I mean, some, some award millions and millions in damages. Some have punitive damages, some don't. Uh, the, the bigger I, forgot, I forgot about that yeah. punitive damages. That's why I want to be on the jury, Alexander. <laughs> and you and you can sit right next to me. And if they ask for punitive damages, they got it. They got it. And so it's not just what a life is worth. It's the punitive damages that you would award. Any jury would award, um, and it would be astronomical in any one case. What is torture worth? Yep, yeah, and there's no, there you can't, you can't really put a number on that because it's, I mean, a human life is not quantifiable in that respect. But there is practice again for certain forms of, of uh, inhumane treatment and torture that human rights courts have actually issued. So you, you didn't refer to that in many ways. Now, I think you just want disqualified yourself as a juror because you announced what you would decide. So you can't sit on that jury. Uh, but th there is also a, a bigger picture to the whole thing, and, and I just use one word to explain it, Treaty of Versailles, or at the end of World War I, where Germany was hit with exactly that. It wasn't civil actions, it was, it was the victorious governments being, basically saying, you caused this, you are liable for this, and we'll take your stuff away and reduce you down to rubble and will destroy your economy, basically, and, and see where that got us, World War II, basically. I mean, that's, that's the narrative of Hitler when he came to power to say, we need to remilitarize, we need to secure territory for our population. And there you go with the attack on Poland and the Czechoslovakia and Austria and so on. Right? So there, the bigger picture, apart from, from uh, justifiable, understandable, revenge and 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 uh, seeking responsibility and liability for the impact for the actions also is how can we how can you create a rush of in the future that actually is a better player in international relations and that should be a major goal i can imagine the the administration right now is is very very much looking into that what what 20 years from now what do we how do we get to a point where we create a russia that 20 years from now we'll still be sitting on a pile of nuclear weapons because they're not going to give it up, but will not be a Putin-style Russia. It might go back to a you know 19 late 1980s, early 1990s kind of Russia that was you know a little more docile, a little bit more subdued, but still uh, a player in international relations. So so in in a way, and I'm playing devil's advocate here. In a way, is it isn't it better if we are agree or not agree, but at least take into consideration some of the underlying grievances that Putin and his people are uttering uh, to come up with a more stable future, even if we do it with a, with a lot of grudging 90s and all that. Now that may be uh, the rational approach, but um, I, I start looking at the options that, that are, when I say options, I mean collective options mm -hmm. uh, that, are, that are available right now to uh, you know, to go down the pike on this, on this invasion, and and none of them appear very good in the short or intermediate term. I mean, one is they take over Ukraine and destroy the whole um, liberal order of the world, and that would happen. Um, two is, um, um, you know, we, we have we have a war, a, a war with Western Europe and with the U.S. and and maybe even a nuclear war or or a biochemical war. Um, he really has made a mess 
Um, and um, I, I suppose everywhere you look, every option, at least in the short and intermediate term, he, he has made a must that is going to result in disruption of the world, of the liberal order, and of the global economy. Uh, all of those things will suffer no matter what happens. That's the way I see it. Tell me I'm wrong. No, I think you're you're absolutely right, and we're already we're we're seeing that. I mean, a regime of sanctions, the one that we have right now, cannot possibly have a, a positive impact on the global economy. Uh, a situation where three plus million refugees overwhelm the the structure and support system of of Eastern Europe and ultimately all of Europe that cannot be good in the long run, uh, and the human suffering cannot be either. I mean, the entire narrative behind that war cannot possibly produce a, a good result. So we're definitely in a situation where bad things can happen. Uh, I also am a, I'm a natural born optimist. I think if we get through the stage right now where all these risk factors are out there, we, we somehow, and I have no prediction, I can't, I can't help you there. Uh, Russian tanks rolling in Moscow and the, the general saying enough is enough, we get rid of these people and then mass executions of, of all the, the Putin supporters is a, is a possibility that you didn't list. It's also not a good possibility, but it is a possibility. Uh, I think the only thing we can do, especially as international lawyers, which I am, we, we, we have to look towards a possible solution that can help us replace some of the old rules, which clearly didn't work. And now we have a war, right? Not a world war, but a substantial war in place. So that could be the moment in time where we say, this is not working, let's throw it out and find something new one. And then maybe also, I mean, China is, is ri rising in, in importance. India is rising in importance. Many other nations that we have not regarded, Latin America, Africa, right? They have contributed less than they should have to the international legal order as we know. So maybe some procedures, some ideas, some norms, some concepts from those cultures and traditions and legal systems could actually help us prop up a better system than we have. Right? Why, why do we need an international court of justice that looks like the US Supreme Court? Have you ever seen a picture of it? It looks like a Western court, right? It wouldn't be recognizable as a solid foundational court in many African countries. Courts in Africa look different. Right. Maybe it's a good idea to think outside of the box. Well, at the end of the day, you know, in my legal practice and exposure to the law over my lifetime, I've always been led to the conclusion that international law is a paper tiger, uh, that, that there's no norms you can count on, that it, people do not, countries do not respect it, uh, countries uh, change it, ignore it, what have you. Uh, no, one, no one feels that there's a strong body of international law out there that will save the world. Um, but there are a lot of international lawyers like you, for example, um, who have been, um, you know, who have been in the game for all these years, but whose time has come. Uh, Alexander, your time has come. And the and the the bar, so to speak, the international law bar, its time has come. And um, more than military, uh, more than foreign service and diplomats uh, who, who sit around tables and try to negotiate truces that are never going to happen. It's the people in the courts, the international law, who, the people who look at the UN charter and find a way to fix it. Uh, it's the lawyers that can step up and save the day. Do you agree with that? Hopefully, I'm, 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 glad, I'm glad that you hold lawyers in such high esteem. I'm, I'm, I, feel, uh, I feel vindicated in many ways. Uh, I, also, I also agree with you that there is, you know, if you, if you take the big picture and say international law is violated left and right, where is it? Is a paper tiger or not? Uh, Louis Henkin, actually a famous international lawyer, said very wisely, so international law is followed by almost all nations in almost all situations, almost all the time. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit. It was his words were better than mine. Uh, if you pack up and you know, take a suitcase and fly from Hawaii to Beijing, you fly international law because you have a passport. If, if it wasn't recognized, if there was no international law accepting that US passports and Chinese passports are good for travel, it wouldn't work, right? So there you have already 100 million uh, working situations of international law every single day. 
uh, and, and you, you can count millions more. So international law, of course, when it falls on its nose, it, it gets a big bloody nose. And right now it has a big bloody nose. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but many times, most of the times, almost all of the times, actually, it works pretty well. Uh, and we should always bear that in mind. I think if, if you look at a perspective uh, that is uplifting, that would be it. I think we should start from that. Okay. Uh, okay. I would make a distinction, however, between the law attributable to international travel and the law attributable to affecting international war. Absolutely. That's, Absolutely. Not that's that. where we need you, Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks very much. I, I hope we can do this again because I'm telling you now it's not going it, to it's not going to get better right away, and it will change, and um, very possibly for the worse. And we, we we need to examine, you know, a status report on on these cases, these uh, uh, tribunals, um, and and of course uh, uh, violations of human rights and and um, and uh, atrocities, which are so 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 disruptive. Oh, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm not predicting things usually, but I would predict at least 20 good years of shows on, on this particular issue. <laughs> it's true. You think about World War II, it's still the yeah. subject of, enter, I shouldn't say entertainment, but documentaries and, and yeah. books by the thousands examining what happened you know, 70 years ago. Uh, and this, this what, what is happening here in the past month will be the, the subject of all kinds of examinations. For the rest of our lives and beyond, isn't it true? Uh, the whole world will be re-examined. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there was a tribunal, an international tribunal, sitting in Switzerland actually um, about 20 years ago, less than 20 years ago, that was still working on uh, allocating rightful owners of bank accounts and vaults and so on. That were sitting in Swiss banks that were all uh, Jewish accounts and and, and Jewish uh, valuables. Uh, and that tribunal had the only job of trying to find the legitimate heirs to that. Many, many of them, of course, were um, dead in concentration camps 40 plus years before that happened. So international law doesn't move fast, but it's it's still working on, on, on reconciling, I hope, human values with inhuman actions. Yeah, that's all we can count on the, the war crimes phenomenon that you and I have been discussing. Um, these phenomena will last for many, many generations Absolutely. just to examine what happened here. Thank you so much, Alexander. Uh, Alexander Morawa in, in uh, where are you now? Phoenix? Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. Okay, just checking up. Thank you very <laughs> much for joining me today. Uh, I look forward to our next discussion. Thank you, Jay. It was great to be on the show. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.